tonight. I am Jay Sexton, a professor of history here at Mizzou, and it's uh, my pleasure to host this special event, uh, which is sponsored by the uh, Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy and also the uh, Novak Leadership Institute on campus. Uh, and tonight's lecture is a perfect one for our two institutes uh, to co-sponsor, for it will probe um, an old question, uh, uh, an old question, but a question that's central to both of our missions. Um, do leaders make history? Now, I say this is an old question because it was one that was hotly debated in the period we study at the Kinder Institute, the late 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, this was the time, uh, of course, in which the notion of, of great man history witnessed its modern birth, uh, the moment in which uh, commentators began to attribute almost limitless power uh, to what were the world's first global celebrities, powerful leaders like Napoleon, uh, Toussaint Louverture, uh, Bolivar, Gladstone, um, and here in the United States, of course, Washington and Lincoln. Uh, yet the 19th century was also the era which generated alternative interpretations that held that historical change came not from political leaders, but rather from structural forces like religious belief, political ideology, uh, social movements from the bottom up, um, and perhaps most of all, that new form of political organization that swept across the, the 19th century world, the nation state. Now, neither side won this debate in the 19th century. Um, indeed, the question about the agency of leaders remains um, a live one today. Um, and this is all by way of saying that the time is right for reconsideration of this old question, um, and also that there is no one, and I do mean no one, uh, better to make sense of it all than tonight's speaker, um, Professor Frederick Lugovall, the Lawrence D. Belfer Professor of International Affairs at Harvard's uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, Fred is an authority on U.S. foreign relations um, in the 20th century, especially the Cold War era and the Vietnam War. He's authored 10 books, 10 books, including uh, most recently, a wonderfully uh, insightful and readable biography of the early life of John F. Kennedy. Um, a recurring theme throughout all of his scholarship, throughout all these 10 books, uh, concerns tonight's topic, the, the role of leaders in moments of historical change. Indeed, his very first book, uh, one that I still assign to the students today, uh, entitled Choosing War, The Lost Chance for Peace and the Escalation of War in Vietnam, um, argued that the U.S. escalation early in the Johnson administration was a choice, um, not a predetermined outcome. Um, this idea, this contingent um, origins of the Vietnam War was also explored in his Pulitzer Prize winning book of 2013, Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam. Now, I could talk about Fred's books all day, um, <laughs> and you don't want to hear from uh, me. You, you want to hear from him. But let me give one more shout out to, to what is my favorite lug of all book. Um, I'm going to look at him on the Zoom here to see what he thinks of this. My favorite lug of all book, uh, 2009, America's Cold War, The Politics of Insecurity, co-authored co with the British scholar Campbell Crabe. Craig, um, a wonderful book that showed how the political dynamics of the U.S. Cold War state determined the acceptable policy options on the table uh, for U.S. statesmen as they grappled with how to counter Soviet power. Um, so it is an absolute privilege to um, hand it over to Fred. Before I do, one more quick uh, point, and that's about the format tonight. Um, um, you, this is the Zoom seminar. You can see us. We cannot see you, uh, but we want this to be interactive. Absolutely. Um, so use the chat function on the Zoom to type in your questions. Um, I'll monitor it. Um, also, my colleague, uh, Connor Ewing, a political scientist here who is instrumental in getting Fred to come here. Uh, Connor will also be monitoring it. And then when we get to the Q&A session, uh, we'll ask your questions um, on your behalf. Um, so thank you very much, Fred, for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Well, huge thanks, Jay. I'm just so grateful to be with you this evening. Uh, you and I both had uh, some technical challenges. We were right down to the wire there, but we're both here uh, and uh, delighted to see you. 
Um, grateful to the Kinder Institute and the Novak Institute for this chance. Grateful to Connor uh, and to Cindy, Connor Ewing and, uh, and Cindy Ewing for, for their role in all of this. And as I said, really pleased to be with you. I wish, of course, I could be there in person, but um, this is the next best thing. So question before us, as Jay has indicated, is how should we think about the role of human agency uh, in history? How should we think about it in comparison? How should we think about individuals as compared with deeper forces, impersonal forces. And Jay mentioned the book project that I'm currently engaged in, which is a two volume biography of John F. Kennedy. It was gonna be a one volume work. Uh, I think one of the reasons actually why it is gonna be two volumes, and I pledge to you only two volumes, is precisely because I'm grappling with this question. I'm, I'm trying very hard to contextualize Kennedy's life. I think that's incumbent on any biographer to do. But I think I may be doing, uh, because I'm a historian by training, I'm perhaps maybe, uh, I'm doing it perhaps a bit more than other biographers would. I'm trying to tell the history uh, of Kennedy's era. He lived an during an extraordinary time, 1917 to 63. But I'm also thinking through the, the question that we're gonna be talking about tonight as I proceed. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about Kennedy later in my remarks, we're going to play a couple of clips from White House tapes. So I look forward to that. With Allison's help, we're going to play those a little bit towards, towards the end. Talk a, a bit about some other world leaders and maybe introduce one or two other thoughts along the way. I want to talk a bit about hindsight bias, for example. Um, talk a little bit about counterfactuals, so-called what-if history. So um, we have some things to do. I don't want to get started. I want to leave ample time for discussion. Um, so um, I look forward to, to, to that part of, uh, of the evening. Um, I suppose, given my current book project, you know my answer to the question before us. But I'm going to keep you in suspense. At least pretend for a few minutes to, to hold you in suspense in terms of how I would respond to this, but I will say by way of introduction, and, and Jay alluded to this, this is a debate that really has gone on for as long as we've had historians. In fact, if you go back to Thucydides, the history of the Peloponnesian War written some 2,500 years ago, I think you see in, in, in Thucydides an early example of what we might call structural history. And about the same time, Herodotus gave us an example of um, several works that emphasized human agency. So this goes right back to the beginning. We could take a more recent example, a mere 240 years ago, namely Edward Gibbon, um, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And here with Gibbon, we see both within one work, it's admittedly what is it, six volumes, I think. But nevertheless, Gibbon, I thought was, I think is extraordinary in his ability to build narrative out of human initiative, the contingent, the unexpected, while also showing us the empire's systemic problems, which became steadily more desperate until a kind of inexorable decline sets in. Um, and you know, it, it spells the end of the, of the empire ultimately. So Gibbon is interesting. And if finally we look at our own period, let's say the last, oh, 20 years, 25 years. In other words, the scholarship that we've um, come into the profession with, if I can put it that way, say Jay and myself, I think it's, I've been, I've been thinking about this. Um, I would make the following generalization about the scholarship of our own era. And here, by the way, I mean scholarship by academic historians. We can make an, there's an interesting distinction. We may wanna discuss this if anybody's interested between academic historians on the one hand and say people like Robert Caro, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, Ron Chernow, uh, Stacy Schiff, folks like that, who do marvelous work, by the way, but what I'm talking here really is about academic history. And the, the following generalization is the one I would make. 
for much of this period, again, say the last 20, 25 years. Structural impersonal determinants have been, I think, on the rise, have been supreme even, to the comparative neglect of human agency. It's pretty interesting. What accounts for this? I think one, here again, I would love to, to know what others think about this, but I think that one of the reasons for the primacy of, let's call it deep explanation, is that it offers, those kinds of explanations offer historians broad scope for the exercise of knowledge, advanced learning, interdisciplinarity. It allows historians to bring to the fore those elements that I think appear larger and stronger than the mere actions of individuals, which can by comparison seem, um, how should we put it, um, can seem weak or inadequate, ephemeral maybe. And by the way, parenthetically, I would say this is one reason why for as long as I can remember, PhD students in history have been dissuaded from pursuing biography for their dissertation. Certainly when I was in graduate school, we were told in no uncertain terms, steer clear of biography. Even if you do it in a kind of life and times way that I'm trying to do with JFK, this is not something you want to do with your dissertation. And I think I still certainly uh, have by and large uh, told my own advisees, this is not the time to pursue a biography. You can do that later when you have tenure. That's an interesting um, phenomenon in our discipline. <clears throat> It can be more intellectually gratifying, in other words, more intellectually rich to pursue these subterranean, these, these deeper structural causes uh, whose antecedents can be extensively explored and examined. I also wonder if there's something else going on. Um, it may be, I wonder what you think about this that this scholarly focus, again, I, I would, I would, I would uh, emphasize here academic historians, this emphasis on, on the part of scholars, uh, again, on in impersonal forces, co uh, responds to the understandable, though I would say unfounded, understandable, but unfounded expectation that profound developments must always be the, the result of profound causes. So World War I, for example, that colossal catastrophe of the last century must have had, according to this view, must have had grander causes than the inadequacy of individual leaders sleepwalking into the abyss, to use the title of Christopher Clark's uh, marvelous book, Sleepwalkers. Historians feel the need, in other words, to look for the explanation in deeper forces, in the, in the working out of some complex high historical dialectic, rather than in the myopia and the lack of imagination on the part of European sovereigns and their lieutenants, their subordinates. Maybe they're right about this. It would be an interesting thing to grapple with over, over beers. If I could be with you tonight in Colombia, this would be an interesting thing to discuss. Uh, after, after, after the event. But let's not forget, I guess is what I would say over those beers. Let's not forget Occam's razor, the line of reasoning which says that the simplest, simplest most straightforward, ex ex straightforward explanation is sometimes the best. Now, do not misunderstand me this evening. Structural analysis, I believe, is imperative to an understanding of the human past. It's an approach that helps us to comprehend the limitations imposed on individual agency by institutions. I think Jay referred to some of this in his introduction, social and economic conditions, public opinion, demographic patterns, and other circumstantial factors that lie beyond personality. In other words, human agency is qualified by the conditions in which individuals find themselves, uh, the situations that individuals find themselves, the conditions they find themselves in when making decisions. 
here I love, I've got to give you, and I know you, many of you are familiar with this quote, maybe you even know what's coming, but Karl Marx in his, in the introduction to his essay, uh, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, this is from 1852. So what, uh, almost a couple of centuries ago now, you know the quote, it goes like this, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. What a sentence that is. Just the rhythm, the cadence of the thing. Good writing, as I think we all know, has a rhythm. Uh, and Marx, uh, in, in actually in, in many places, captures it. He certainly has it in this particular sense. Let me give it one more time. Men make their own history but they do, not, they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. What he's capturing here, I believe, is not only the agency of human action, he's also reminding us, Marx is also reminding us that even the most powerful individuals are constricted by time and space, by history and conditions. Let me, let's talk a little bit about a particular example who I think is eternally fascinating. He features actually quite prominently in, my, in volume one of my JFK biography. Turns out he's a kind of lodestar. He's a kind of uh, model for the young JFK. Churchill's leadership uh, is, looks like I have some instability here. I hope you're hearing me. Le Churchill's leadership is in World War II is profoundly important. He united and galvanized the British nation, brought pol uh, politicians from rival parties into his war cabinet. He made his deputy prime minister, Clement Attlee, um, uh, he made Clement Attlee his deputy prime minister. He was the labor party head. Churchill also claimed broad executive powers, forged an effective working relationship with Franklin Roosevelt and with Joseph Stalin, his two Grand Alliance partners. And of course, he used Churchill to great effect, his extraordinary talents as a wordsmith as an or and as an orator. As more than one commentator has noted, Churchill mobilized the English language and took it into battle. Yet, for all of Churchill's powers that he has assumed, for all of his pugnacious charisma, he could not, Churchill could not prevent the Nazi juggernaut from rolling across the continent, or later, keep the Red Army from conquering Eastern Europe. He couldn't stop Japan from seizing much of the British Empire in the Far East. In fact, he needed the Americans to take, a, take charge of the struggle there. And as much as Churchill tried, he could not first forestall the end of the empire as a whole, or halt the relative decline of his nation's global political power, geopolitical power. In other words, Churchill could not change the flow of history, and he had to fashion his policies within the constraints he inherited as Marx understood. That's Churchill. Consider the Cold War. I, I could spend, of course, uh, uh, far too much time on the superpower confrontation after 1945. As I think Jay mentioned, it has been the focus of much of my own work. But just a few observations about, about the Cold War. Um, it's clear to me, perhaps to all of you, that that struggle resulted in part, in substantial part, from the deeply unsettling effects of the Second World War on the international system. The great powers were left in, in ruins. Only the United States was accepted, I think, from this. Um, collapse of Germany and Japan created a post-war vacuum into which the two main remaining powers, major powers, were drawn. Soviet Union and the United States. Also, the gradual 
disintegration of empires mattered, as did the different economic and strategic needs and, and different ideologies of the two giants, the Soviet Union and the US. They had, diff they had a, host a, a history of hostility and tension. Both were militarily powerful. In other words, there were systemic reasons to expect that the Grand Alliance of World War II would wither, would disappear, and that discord would follow. The question, though, is whether it had to be a Cold War. I'm not so sure. I've written about this in various um, contexts. We could pursue that further if somebody wants to. We certainly can't look at that. Uh, we can't answer that question only by looking at impersonal forces. Individual leaders mattered, especially Stalin and the Soviet Union. Your, your fellow Missourian Harry Truman is important. Other Western leaders matter as well. And in terms of the perpetuation of the Cold War, decade after decade, here again, I think individuals matter. And if we turn finally to the end of the Cold War, then uh, one person in particular matters. And I'll talk about him in a second. You know who it is. Though here again, of course, we should acknowledge people that uh, there are structural forces that are important. In particular, I would say the so the over time, the Soviet economy proved uh, socialist economy proved less and less able to compete with the American free market economy, less and less able to promote com uh, to cope with the demands of the Soviet and the Eastern European people. Uh, and the Soviet Union, you could argue, by by the mid 1970s, if not before, was a kind of giant Potemkin village. Uh, I don't think that's putting it too strongly. Still, nevertheless, one leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, hugely important. The Soviet Empire, it seems to me, might have hobbled on for years more, maybe decades, had it not been for Gorbachev. So he's surely one of the most influential figures of the 20th century, in my view, certainly the second half of the 20th century. Because through a series of unexpected overtures and decisions, Gorbachev fundamentally transformed the, na the, the nature of the superpower relationship in a way that scarcely could have been anticipated even a few years before. Had any other Politburo member, I think there were nine others, had any one of the other nine taken power when Chernenko died in, in uh, March, I believe it's March 1985. I think Soviet policy would have been very different had any one of them taken power as they could have heard, or certainly there were several contenders for that, for that position. Reagan's position, US President Ronald Reagan's position, I would say was less crucial, but still important. Not so much because of his hardline policies in his first term, but because of his later willingness to enter into serious negotiations with Gorbachev uh, and be more of a partner uh, or treat Gorbachev more as a partner than as an adversary. And I would say George H.W. Bush uh, followed this basic approach. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is the point that I'm making. The point I'm making is that too often, Structural explanations, soaring high above the give and take of everyday human interaction, tend toward a deterministic view of historical development, which give the impression that what happened had to happen. Uh, the French philosopher Henri Bergson has a, has a marvelous phrase, which I like to use. He calls it, the illusion of retrospective determinism. The illusion of retrospective determinism. Um, the result, I think, is to conceal the fluidity of past situations, to blot out the effects of contingencies, and to absolve individual human beings of personal responsibility. After all, they're mere captives of forces beyond their control. And by the way, parenthetically, I'll say that in the present day, this can foster a disinclination to challenge the, the status quo. 
what's the point of working to bring about change in society if everything significant that occurs is bound to happen anyway? What I'm talking here about is hindsight bias. Something that we see in all our areas of human existence. Psychologists have long since understood, long since determined, that people have an amply documented tendency to exaggerate in retrospect the likelihood of an observed outcome. They see the future as more contingent than the past. The refrain becomes, oh, I knew it all along, even when the outcome looked doubtful or was wholly unanticipated beforehand. I knew the Soviet Union would collapse. I knew Hillary Clinton would lose. Um, I knew that Brady would beat the Chiefs or some such assertion. What then? is the answer to these kinds of deterministic propensities. If you're with me to this point, what's the answer? Well, one antidote is counterfactual analysis, also known as what if uh, analysis, which can bring to the fore plausible but unrealized alternatives to what actually occurred can convey the differing dimensions of past situations and the presence of contingency. That's my belief. I've talked elsewhere about this mode of analysis. I've even laid down some ground rules. We could talk about those ground rules for conducting such uh, counterfactual uh, analysis. I'll say only here that those in our profession, uh, including my own colleagues in my history department here, wonderful scholars, all of them, some of them I think uh, or shall we say not persuaded by this, they frown uh, on uh, counterfactual analysis. They basically say, Fred, we have enough difficulty uh, understanding what did happen in history. Let's not waste time on speculating about what might have happened. I think they're wholly unpersuasive. On the contrary, thinking about alternatives is an in indispensable part of the historian's craft. We can judge the forces that one out that prevailed only by caring, but comparing them with those that were defeated. The investigation of unrealized alternatives, in other words, provides crucial insight into why things turned out as they did. That's my argument. Moreover, here's what I like to point out to my skeptics. All historians, whenever they make causal judgments, and by the way, I recognize that uh, you know, history is not just about causality. And there, I have colleagues who are not so much focused on us as, as maybe I am. But whenever historians make causal judgments, they're engaging in speculation, are con contemplating alternative developments, even when those alternatives are not stated explicitly, which means that to vow to say nothing counterfactual can therefore mean vowing to say nothing at all. Um, and if you look, for example, I won't have time to, I won't go into detail here, go, go into detail here on the Vietnam War. But if you look at that long and bloody struggle for Vietnam, lasted more than three decades, caused somewhere on the order of two to three million deaths, especially in Vietnam and, in, and Cambodia and Laos in, in, in Southeast Asia itself. It's a struggle that lasted about three decades, and I've studied now for almost that length of time. I think that careful counterfactual thought experiments can help us better understand just how vital was the contribution of certain individuals. We could look, for example, at Ho Chi Minh, obviously of, of great importance. On the French side, we'd look, we could look at Georges Bidot, who's really there from the beginning of the French war right to the end, a fascinating figure. On the American side, there's a reason why we often refer to it as Johnson's War. Um, my book, Embers of War, which Jay kindly mentioned, pointed, uh, looked at the long-term causes of US intervention, going back to World War II, to the French war, the Franco-Vietnam war that followed, 
Um, it argued for the importance of Cold War, perceived Cold War imperatives that drove successive American administrations forward in Indochina. Um, it looked at how the end of European empires contributed to the struggle. Nevertheless, notwithstanding those long-term causes, um, I don't think there's any doubt that Lyndon Johnson's imprint mattered enormously in the end. And what's remarkable about Johnson, happy to talk about this further if you wish. What's remarkable about Johnson is that he escalated and perpetuated a war that he privately doubted from the start, from before the start, was either necessary or winnable. It's a key finding of my research over the last two decades, 25 years. Uh, he, he, he took the war, he took the United States into a war that he privately doubted. Took the plunge anyway. He always saw, Johnson did, attacks on the policy as attacks on himself saw American credibility and his own personal credibility as essentially synonymous. So we can't just think about American credibility with respect to Johnson or probably any other president. You've also got to look at personal credibility, partisan credibility. We need a three-part conception of credibility. But what Johnson did in personalizing everything is he diminished his ability to render objective judgment. He failed to see that the international context, the domestic context, in, say, late 1964, he has just crushed Barry Goldwater in the presidential election of 1964. He's got huge majorities in both houses of Congress. The international context and the domestic context, context gave him considerable freedom of maneuver on the war. Johnson... Um, this is my trans transition to JFK, and I'm, then I'm going to wrap up, uh, and we can get to some discussion. Johnson differed from Kennedy um, in important ways. Kennedy used his advisory system differently than, than Johnson did, was much more open to hearing different points of view among his subordinates. And we can talk, if you're interested, uh, as we get into discussion. Uh, we can talk about what this meant for Vietnam policy under Kennedy. Uh, obviously, something I'm going to be dealing with uh, at length in volume two of my biography. He, it actually, Indochina figures uh, in important ways even in volume one, because Kennedy has a long-standing interest in this part of the world. But it's going to be important in volume two, and we can talk further about this if, if anybody wishes. But let me instead spend my few remaining moments on a different topic one that's been a principal research focus of mine actually in just the last few weeks, last few months, namely the Cuban Missile Crisis. As close as we ever got, ladies and gentlemen, to nuclear annihilation, a very important moment in, in 20th century international history, uh, needless to say, brought us as close as we've ever come to the catastrophe of nuclear war. What I've been doing totally fascinating work is, even if you're not writing a biography of the man, is going through the tapes and the transcripts from the deliberations of the so-called XCOM, which is the Executive Committee of the, Committee of the National Security Council. And doing that uh, has revised my thinking in certain ways that I think bear on the topic of hand at hand. So this, some of this is quite new in terms of my own thinking, and I'm trying it out on you this evening. Uh, and by the way, I think you know this, but Kennedy began, I think I should mention this for anybody who doesn't, he installed, he had an, a taping system installed in the White House uh, in early 1962, probably because he wanted this to be uh, the, the, the uh, what should I say, the source of material for his memoirs that he was going to write after he left office. He may have had other motives too. I think maybe he wanted to be able to, to, to check, uh, to defend himself against charges that he had said X, Y, or Z when in fact he hadn't 
that might have been a motive as well. But there's a taping system, absolute goldmine for historians. Um, and of course, we also have tapes under Johnson. We have tapes under Nixon. Strangely enough, they stop uh, at that point. We may have to figure out why that is. But in the missile crisis, um, let me just spend a few minutes on this. There's a paradox, maybe we should note at the outset, in the sense that there's no doubt in my mind that the United States, under Eisenhower and Kennedy, uh, must claim some significant responsibility uh, for the crisis erupting in the first place, for the onset of the crisis, through their anti-Castro actions. And ironically, those anti-Castro actions, maybe especially the so-called Operation Mongoose, which was a covert action uh, program under Kennedy to destabilize the Castro government, perhaps assassinate Castro, certainly get him removed from power, those actions by the United States contributed to Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev's decision to deploy missiles on the island in the first place, because he wanted to discourage further US or US backed military action against Castro. But here's the paradox, listening closely to the XCOM tapes, and we're going to hear from a couple of them in just a second. Rereading the transcripts and other materials has convinced me of Kennedy's crucial role in guiding his advisors and the world away from a cataclysmic nuclear conflict. What comes through, it seems to me, is his understated but consistent management of the internal deliberations, his calm and self-possessed demeanor, even in the face of severe questioning from his most senior military and civilian aides. From day one to the end, people, 13 days total. Kennedy allows people to have their say. That's a pretty interesting part of these conversations. Whether or not he agrees with them, never resorts to the harsh put down. Rarely in these meetings does he even raise his voice. Even when he's obviously perturbed or irritated, he nudges the discussion forward when it threatens to bog down. And by the way, I would say that the paper records are not sufficient here that you actually need to listen to tapes uh, to, to full, get a full sense of what's going on. And he moved steadily away from what his advisors wanted. Uh, we hear him on the tapes consistently disavowing doctrinaire judgments, confrontational recommendations, uh, especially after the first three or four days of the crisis. He wanted to find an answer short of nuclear confrontation. One of the themes that I develop already in volume one of my biography is that he's skeptical about uh, the utility of, of military force to solve political conflicts. And I think he believes long before October 62 that superpower military conflict is impossible, must be impossible in the nuclear age. Um, and so sometimes he's a minority of one in these, com in these uh, XCOM deliberations in wanting to pursue a political solution. What happens, and I'll just mention here that on, on, uh, to set the context for the tape that we're about to play, is that already on the 18th of October, which is the third day of the crisis, he wonders, Kennedy does, if he, do if he doesn't need to give Khrushchev a way out um, to find some way of saving face. And Kennedy suggests, October 18th, uh, we could say, and I quote, if you pull them out, we'll take ours out of Turkey. Meaning if you uh, withdraw the missiles from Cuba, we'll take ours. These are Jupiter missiles that the United States has directed at the Soviet Union from Turkey. On that meeting on the 18th, the remark goes unanswered by Kennedy's advisors. Fast forward to the 27th, which is the second, the second to last day of the crisis, uh, when Ken Khrushchev has proposed just such a trade. Um, that's the context for the second tape that we're going to play for you when you see that Kennedy is inclined to take that uh, trade. So, uh, and you'll see some pushback from his advisors. Um, so let's listen to a couple of these. Um, the first, this is just going to be about uh, two minutes on the first clip. 
and then maybe about three and a half on the second, and then I'm gonna wrap up. The first clip, which Allison is gonna play for us here in a minute, is from October 22nd. So uh, about a week into the crisis, so at the, about the midpoint. And it's a com telephone conversation between John F. Kennedy and his predecessor, Dwight Eisenhower. Um, the second clip um, is from the 27th, as I said, and that is in the, on the afternoon, 4 p.m. on the 27th. Uh, there is this trade that is now on the table secretly, uh, and you'll hear Kennedy's uh, articulation of, of what should be done and why, and some pushback from McGeorge Mundy, his national security advisor. On this first tape, first tape that uh, Eisenhower's going to play, note, if you would, Eisenhower's militancy. I think it's pretty interesting how aggressive the former president is. Uh, there's also a chuckle at the end from, from JFK that I sort of puzzle over a little bit about why he's chuckling, although I have my theory as to why. So, Allison, if you would, let's roll the first of the clips. Not getting sound yet. Allison, if you can hear me, are you able to get sound for us? Start it over. Okay, let me see what's the problem. Um, is there, can you hear this? Can, no, can we're not hearing any sound. We're seeing the transcript move, but we're not getting sound. Huh, I wonder what's... Uh, oh, there you go. So maybe just turn up the volume a bit. Yeah, it's unstable. Oh, are you are you not hearing anything? We had it. For, we had it for just. A, we had a little bit of Kennedy, and that's and then we we lost it again. Oh, okay. we, what we could do, uh, Allison, is um, maybe come back to these two in the Q and A. I could proceed. Okay. Or I don't know how you want to. Or forget it altogether, but it would be fun to hear them. Yeah, let's try it one more. N nothing. You hear, hearing anything? Yeah, we're hearing something now. Okay, let me start this one more time. Well, I, uh, thank you for having called me, and I will, uh, I, uh, personally, uh, I, I think okay. I'm going to make some Yeah, it's, it's tough to, uh, as I say, uh, we will, uh, I don't know, we may get into the invasion business before many days are out, but, uh, Personally, I just don't quite go along, you know, with that thinking. My idea is that the dam told the 
yet will do whatever they want when they figure it is good for them. And I don't believe they relate one situation with another. That's what they find out they do here and there and the other. And we're we're already standing at the, the unit with NATO that if they go to Berlin, they're gone. That means that they've got to to look out that they don't get a, a terrific uh, It was still it's, Eisenhower for some reason wasn't coming in as clearly as he might, but you get some sense, people, on that tape uh, of obviously the tension. Uh, I think I suspect one of the reasons why Kennedy chuckles there toward the end is, is that you know he understands the absurdity of, the, of this whole thing that um, the future of the human race might here hang in the balance, um, and it became really close. I'm thinking, Allison, given also I have one eye on the clock and we want to get to some discussion, maybe we won't play the second of our tapes. Um, uh, we, if we decide we want to do that, uh, if there's an opportunity during the Q&A, we can come back to it. I'll simply say here that what it is, and you can find this on the Miller Center at, at the University of Virginia, on the Miller Center website, you can find these and other tapes. And I love, love that the Miller Center has made it possible for us to hear these tapes and follow along the transcript. But the one on the 27th is again, Kennedy arguing for basically accepting the trade. And he basically says at one point, you know, the rest of the world is gonna say that Khrushchev's offer is a pretty reasonable offer. Uh, and ultimately he, of course, his view, Kennedy's view prevails. Um, and it's, um, you know, the crisis ends basically. Um, with that, with that deal, provided this is a this is a, a stipulation on the from the Americans that this deal be kept secret. The Americans will remove their 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 uh, their Jupiter missiles from Turkey in exchange for the Soviets removing theirs from Cuba. Um, again, and I'm going to wrap up here, people, so we can get to the discussion. Again. We should note that this same Kennedy helped bring on the crisis to begin with. So I, I give him mixed marks, uh, mixed grades overall here in terms of uh, this crisis and Cuban, Cuba policy in general. And it bears noting, I think, that even after the missile crisis, Kennedy continued to um, try to thwart the Cuban revolution. revolution. He tried to uh, destabilize the Castro government policies that in hindsight, I would argue, look counterproductive uh, and short-sighted to say the least. Still, during those 13 days, folks, those fateful days, 13 days in October, 1962, a year before his assassination, Kennedy was at his best in my view. And for that, we can all be grateful. A cold warrior in, in public, he distrusted the military for reasons that I lay out in volume one, as I said. He was dubious about the political utility of military action. He was repelled by the prospect of nuclear war, and he had the courage and the will to act accordingly. That's basically my summation. He showed, it seems to me, at a key moment, a capacity for empathetic understanding. This was evident in his personality from a young age, again, something that I explore in the first volume of my biography. In this case, what it meant is that he was able to put himself into Khrushchev's shoes. 
That's what empathy is. Uh, he could see, he could see, try to see things from the Soviet leader's perspective, which I think was critical at this point. It brings us back, as I conclude, folks, to Marx's dictum. The great German thinker was right. Human beings make their own history, but not as they please. The historian's task, this is one of the reasons I love being a historian, because this is endlessly fascinating. The historian's task is to take account of this reality. Again, human, human being make, humans make their own history, but not as they please. Take account of this reality, to balance the elements of human agency on the one hand with impersonal forces on the other, and to write a history that weaves together all the causative factors and takes, them, uh, uh, takes into account their interaction. Because after all, whereas impersonal elements may, may make, human, uh, make events in human affairs possible, individuals make those events happen. And with that, um, uh, folks, I conclude. Uh, let's have some discussion. And I thank you for, uh, for paying attention. Uh, back to uh, Jay and I think to Connor. Thank you. OK, th thank you so much, Fred. That, that was wonderful. Um, you uh, said that the, the hallmark of JFK during the Cuban Missile Crisis was that he stayed calm. Uh, you stayed even calmer during a Zoom crisis. So you're, you're taking on the persona of the person you're writing about, which is actually our first question from Billy Coleman. Um, and, and Billy asks about, you know, why um, you're saying why historians don't write about individuals or give individuals agency. And he suggests that maybe it's because, you know, they get criticized as being too, uh, identifying too much. They love the, 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 the people they're writing about too much, or actually because they want to uh, defrock the great men. They want to cut them down to size. So I wondered if you thought that was a part of the explanation here. And I wondered if, if, you've, if you'd sort of struggled with this question, actually writing about JFK, where do you stand on it? Do you, yeah. do you like him more the more you write about him, or do you like, like him less? Well, I think Billy's question is a really good question. Um, and I suspect there is something to this, that this is partly what, is, what maybe uh, explains the disinclination of historians to take this kind of work seriously sometimes. Uh, and why, as I suggested, we uh, advise our graduate students. I don't know, Jay, if you do the same, but certainly I have, I have suggested to them gently, uh, this is not something to pursue at this particular point. And I'll just mention one quick example here. Uh, which I kind of regret, which is probably why I remember it. I had a graduate student years ago. My first teaching position was, was at UC Santa Barbara. And I had a very bright student and she came up to me and she said, I want to write a dissertation on Arthur Schlesinger Jr. And what did she say? The, the fall of American liberalism or the crisis of American liberalism. She explained what she wanted to do. And I said, this is a great topic. Don't do it uh, because I was worried because she was going to have a heavily biographical uh, dimension, and I worried how she would fare in the job market. Uh, she it had a, it has a happy ending in that she chose a different topic that worked really well for her, and she's got a terrific job. But you know, in other words, I'm not sure. Um, this is I'm taking taking the answer in a certain direction. I'm not sure that. Um, that it's in all instances the right thing for us to be advising our graduate students. But I do think there is something to this particular explanation for why biography is viewed, as you say, Billy, in the way it is. And I think, Jay, in terms of your question, I do think about this. Um, I think I was sympathetic to Kennedy going into this project. Uh, I've, I've written about him in other, uh, in other books and articles. So I had a familiarity, especially with his foreign policy. Uh, and I sometimes wonder, my wife will ask if I've become more sympathetic since I started. I'm not sure. I, I certainly see his flaws in a way that maybe I didn't when I didn't know as much about him. Um, and I think I've learned a lot about how he treated um, Jackie, uh, the tendency to sometimes uh, you know, treat women as objects to be conquered, which is something his father certainly exhibited. I write about this at length. 
uh, mistakes that he made in terms of his policy decisions as president. I'm, I'm conscious of those. Broadly speaking, though, I'm still uh, I, I'm still sympathetic to the man. Uh, I think he had greatness within. I don't think myself we can put him on in the pantheon of great presidents. He didn't live long enough. Uh, and probably the great presidents have to encounter crises, whether war, depression, um, that he didn't have and maybe would not have had even in a second term. Um, but it's, um, it's overall a sympathetic assessment. And I'm conscious of the fact that we do tend to get really close to our subjects, Jay. I think that's the, the thrust of, of, your, of your question. And so I try to guard against it. I'm jumping in here to, to keep going with the questions and we certainly have no shortage of questions. So this is great. Uh, at Kinder, we like to have uh, student questions when possible. Great. And I'm very happy to say that we not only do we have one, it's one of my students from, from Lucy Cook. Uh, and it goes right to uh, where you started um, your, your talk. And she asks, can you elaborate on your comment that in, um, for historians uh, saying nothing, uh, academic historians saying nothing mm -hmm. counterfactual in some ways equates to saying nothing at all. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm kind of exaggerating for effect, but um, I do think, uh, and 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 we can think of interesting examples of this. That is to say, renowned historians who will, on the one hand, attack counterfactual uh, history as a waste of time, as sophomoric, as a parlor game, uh, et cetera. And then if you read their work, it's littered with counterfactual uh, analysis. Uh, they just don't call it that. They are always, as I said, if they're interested in causality, it seems to me that they are always imagining alternative developments. Good example of this is E.H. Carr famously was really critical of, of this kind of work of counterfactuals. And yet, if you look at his work on, on the early Soviet Union, for example, and the development of the Soviet Union, um, you see all kinds of instances in which he's thinking about, let's say Bukharin, Bukharin prevails in the Soviet leadership struggle, um, what that would have meant and what would have happened if Lenin had lived longer and so on and so forth. Um, Richard Evans, great British historian at Cambridge, uh, uh, is famous for being highly negative, uh, very dismissive of counterfactual analysis. All over Evans's work, uh, you see this kind of thing. So I'm not sure if that's, a, if that's an answer, direct answer to your question, but I do think if you're actually going to live by that dictum, in other words, I will not do counterfactual uh, work, I will not have those kinds of, I will not imagine unrealized alternatives in history, then you certainly shouldn't be writing about um, the history of decision-making. Uh, you should not be writing about high politics or politics uh, period, because I don't think you're going to be able to avoid it. And then you would be saying nothing at all. Okay, we have a classic Cold War question here from Robert Collins. He's, uh, you mentioned the end of the Cold War. He wants to know what the basis for judging Gorbachev's role um, in the outcome as being more significant than Reagan's. Well, I mean, maybe this is a, um, a simplistic answer, Robert, in which case you can come back at me. Um, but I think... I think it's hard to imagine a different Soviet leader making the policy decisions that Gorbachev made, both domestically and abroad. And it's not hard to imagine a different American leader making the decisions that Reagan made in responding to Gorbachev's overtures. So I'm really I'm making two points there. One is that it seems to me that Gorbachev is the initiator. He does much more in, you know, 85 to 89 than does Reagan. And, and it's also, as I say, that it requires, it seems to me, I'm not sure you or other people would necessarily agree with this, but it requires Gorbachev 
I don't think it requires Reagan. And I still give Reagan high marks here. I think Reagan understands. So this is not in any way a criticism of him. I think he understands that he needs to, he wants to respond. He needs to respond to treat, as I think I said earlier, Gorbachev as a partner rather than as an adversary. That's huge. So I give, I give Reagan credit. Um, but uh, I can imagine a, a Walter Mondale Unlikely, of course, that he would have been president here, but let's say it's Mondale or George H.W. Bush if he becomes president earlier than he did. Let's say Reagan uh, dies early in his second term or something. Uh, that I can, I, can, I can see the U.S. response being more or less what it is under Reagan. But that's very hard to do with Gorbachev. Next question is from uh, Bill Thompson who asks, to what extent is the emphasis on structural analysis an attempt to rationalize essentially random events and the de-emphasis on biography, a recognition of the fragility of identifying the ever-changing traits that will matter in the future? Hmm. I don't know. That's uh, an interesting point. I, I suspect... I suspect... Uh, for at least some historians um, who emphasize, who, who, who take this approach of emphasizing subterranean forces. Uh, it, there may be at least in part a motivation along those lines. Uh, I think it's more important perhaps what I suggested earlier that, because um, I, I, this resonates with me certainly from my graduate training. There is a sense that in fact, it's, uh, it's richer, it's deeper, uh, it's ultimately more satisfying. Uh, it's somehow more important um, to look at uh, these deeper forces. Uh, you have more explanatory power, they will say. It surely, and then as I said, as I suggested also, if we're talking about monumental development, such as the two world wars, Surely it, 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 it can't just hinge on the role of, of, of a handful of individuals. But let's talk about another example that I didn't mention here. Uh, and I'm, I, I, this may take us away, Bill, from your question, but we haven't talked about the origins of the Second World War. I reviewed a book a few months ago, Bill, uh, a new book on the origins of the war. And I began the review by saying what a remarkable thing it is that this conflagration, which caused tens of millions of lives, unfathomable destruction, happened because of the will of one man. That's how I began the review. Yes, I then went on to say, of course, we can talk about deeper causes, structural causes of the Second World War in Europe, but fundamentally, it began because Adolf Hitler was determined, I think, in the summer, the, the author, I think, demonstrates to my satisfaction uh, uh, of this book, was determined to have war in the summer of 1939. He hoped it would be confined to Poland. He wasn't necessarily interested at this point in taking on the French and the Germans, uh, French and the British. But if, in fact, it became a war also against the French and the British, so be it that he brooked no opposition to doing this, was determined to have it happen, and it did. And in fact, none of the other major leaders in Europe uh, wanted war at that particular point, uh, which again, I think I've, I've, I've sort of danced around the heart of your question, but um, that it seems to me speaks to the, to the prime importance on certain questions in particular, of individuals. Um, again, even, even Hitler, of course, would be constrained, of course, by, by circumstances beyond his control. Uh, but in terms of that origins of that struggle, uh, it seems to me it has a great deal to do with this one figure. Okay, we, we've got a great question here. We got actually several great questions in the queue, but I want to jump to the one from uh, Justin Dyer, um, a political scientist and, and the Kinder Institute director. And he asks about, um, you know, 
impersonal forces or what we're calling impersonal forces that actually aren't people making those structures. Um, human decisions, he writes, on a mass scale shape our institutions, our environment, um, our religious practices, etc. So could you say a bit more about how you see the human element in the structural and social trends that shape historical eras that do admittedly seem to be beyond any one individual's yeah. control? It's a, it's a great point. Um, it's a really great point, Justin. Uh, and in fact, as I think about this, this is just, I'm thinking about this as, as I formulate an answer. Most of them have human beings really uh, at, at, at the core of them. Um, you know, if you think about, um, you know, the role played by popular views, public opinion, which I think in my own work on US foreign policy matters greatly, and which I would say on some level is a, is a structural phenomenon. Maybe we can debate that one. Um, that, of course, speaks precisely to the point that you're making. If you think about the role played by ideology, critical in the Cold War, though I think less important maybe than some historians have suggested. So maybe I qualify that as soon as I say it. But nevertheless, the, the deep ideological schism between East and West, between the Soviet Union and the United States, is... is profoundly important and is, of course, fundamentally about um, ideas that, uh, that intellectuals and others have put forth uh, and have, have caused this schism. Even demographic patterns, which are so important uh, and or can be so important. Um, so I guess I'm hard pressed. I don't know, Jay, if you want to jump in on this one or if... if um, if Justin can, can, can come in as well, but I'm trying to think of exceptions to this, um, but it's a really interesting point that you make. We can push ahead unless Justin wants to, to jump in. Uh, we have some, some good kind of bread and butter history questions. Okay. Uh, the first is from Christopher Deutsch, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of History uh, here, and it's about sources. He asks, do, the big question is, do sources matter when trying to capture the role of individuals? But he's concerned with um, kind of how exceptional some of the sources that you relied on mm -hmm. are. He's, he notes that the JFK, LBJ, and Nixon tapes are a rare source and not all topics have uh, good mm -hmm. tapes, or at least not that good. Um, and how that factors into your, your emphasis on, on modes of, of telling and, and researching history. Yeah, Christopher, it's a good question. Um, and I think I am fortunate um, in the kinds of sources that I have available to me in, the, in, in this JFK project, but also more broadly in my, in my career to this point. And I've thought about that. Um, sometimes I feel like we almost have too many sources. You know, it can be absolutely or overwhelming when as a graduate student, I first visited the Johnson Library in Austin, marvelous facility. And I just begin to get a sense of how much material there is. Um, so I suppose the best thing I can do, Christopher, is answer this from my own, my own perspective and maybe that of graduate students who have worked under me, um, which is to say, of course, that the sources don't tell us everything. Um, there are silences and even the best uh, materials that we have. We have to act, it seems to me, as historians on inference. I tell my students that frequently. No, no, I have no problem with that as long as it's from the basis of, of informed use of the best material that they can get their hands on. Um, and, um, you know, we take the evidence where we can get it. That said, absolutely, I would say that the, the stuff that I've been able to get um, you know, in my work, um, has given me great confidence in the, the conclusions that I reach. I'm a historian of policymaking. Um, and again, it's U.S. foreign policy, principally post-1945 in my case. It's an embarrassment of riches. Um, I think somebody who's working maybe on policymaking in a different era, different country, or more recent history, is not going to have access to those things, and that can be a problem. If you're not a historian of policy, then of course um, your your both the questions you ask, the sources you use are really different. 
but do I think to put it to put to put it sort of specifically? Do I feel at this point that I have a pretty good handle on why Lyndon Johnson acted as he did on the Vietnam War? Yeah, I do. Even though maybe this will sound contradictory, on some level there's a mystery. You know, I I, I feel in some ways less confident now in, 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 in describing US intervention in Vietnam as a whole, I feel less confident in it now, maybe than I did when I was in my first graduate seminar in New Haven in the fall of 1989. Um, because, and I'll keep this short because I could talk way too long about this. If you, as the, and this goes to the point about sources, if you see Johnson's own pessimism, and his own doubts that the outcome even matters at all. What is Vietnam worth to me? What's it worth to this country? He says to McGeorge Bundy in the middle of 1964, long before he commits ground troops. If you look at the misgivings in the Senate and the House, especially among Democrats, if you look at the war weariness and the apathy in South Vietnam, if you look at the opposition among allied governments, French, Canadians, the British, Japanese, um, uh, if you look at editorial opinion in the key US newspapers prior to the escalation. You begin to think the strange thing here is not that, or it's, 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 it's on some level difficult to explain this thing. Um, but I feel like I've gotten a pretty good handle on him and it's because of the wide variety of sources I can use. I'm not sure that's a, a, good, a really good answer to your question, Christopher, but that's an answer. Okay, we, we got um, several more questions. We're going to try to to run through. Fred, thank you yeah. so much. You're doing you're doing great here. Uh, you'll know Victor McFarland, um, oh, our course. colleague here. Yes. Um, and okay, Victor's like doing the 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 cross discipline thing for the Kinder Institute. He's saying, hey, maybe we need to learn from political scientists, mm -hmm. um, who of course do have a real elaborate thing about decision making and and so forth. Uh, so, what what do we have? What what does political science have to offer historians when it comes to the the sorts of questions that that you're asking? Well, it's a kind of um, it's great to great to hear from from you, Victor. Um, we had Victor here with us in Cambridge for a, for an academic year, I guess the year before last, and it was great to have him here. Um, well, this is a, what the political scientists would call a level of analysis issue, isn't it? That I'm talking that we're talking about tonight, um, and so they they have thought a lot about this, and maybe maybe that's even a helpful formulation that. Um, uh, that to think about it as different levels of analysis and that what I'm arguing for tonight uh, is the primacy or at least the important role played by individual, in my case, decision makers. Um, and they would also encourage them to look at different uh, uh, levels of analysis. And that's helpful. Um, uh, and I think, I think the other thing that, that political scientists teach us to do um, is of course to, to generalize. Sometimes we resist their desire always to generalize. Uh, and we like to go to the particular, that's why we're historians. But I think we can overdo that. I think there's a way, Victor, for us to um, uh, stand firm on what we believe, which is that um, uh, situations in the past uh, decisions made again by by in this case leaders uh, let's say in the united states or elsewhere are in some cases unique but we can still generalize um and uh that's something that i think they insist upon one of the reasons i love as i think victor knows i love having a foot in the history department at harvard and in a policy school at harvard the kennedy school um is because I interact at the Kennedy School with social scientists. In fact, uh, we historians have, are a very small number of people. We humanists, I would say, are a very small number of people in the faculty at the Kennedy School. But what they will tell me continuously, and when I present my work to them, as I do, and we all do, really valuable for me to see just how they look at things, the kinds of questions they ask, their desire to see how 
this could connect, let's say, Kennedy's decision making on on Cuba, how it could connect with decisions made in this other place or this other time. How can we generalize? What are the lessons we can draw from this? Um, I find that both invigorating and really helpful, even if, as I said, I will sometimes uh, fall back on my historian's training and emphasize the importance of particularity and, and, and the importance of uh, investigating specific historical questions um, and not um, going quite as broad as they like to go. Great, we have a couple uh, more specific particular questions. And the first is from uh, Edwin Santana, uh, who's a graduate student in political science. And this is mm. uh, essentially accounting for the difference in Kennedy's conduct and leadership between mm. uh, the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. So uh, Edwin asks, did he learn from the mistakes he made before? Was he more mm. confident in his decision-making after being president for a few years? Yeah, I think, I think he was. Uh, uh, you know, this is a t subject that I'm just in the midst of researching now. Uh, I've been looking closely at the Bay of Pigs and what lessons or, you know, what conclusions he draws from that. And he does become more skeptical of the advice that he gets, especially from the uniformed military in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs. Uh, becomes more skeptical of what the CIA wants to tell him. Some of that he had beforehand, as I suggested earlier. Uh, I think some, uh, some historians have overdone the degree to which I, after the Bay of Pigs, all of a sudden he says, oh, wow, uh, you know, everything the military says is not true. Well, um, he shows that even in World War II, he's in the South Pacific uh, in 1943, and his letters home are just remarkable for showing already now, already then, his um, deep skepticism about uh, about the military brass and what they're what they're saying, I think he carries that with him, uh, and has that long before the Bay of Pigs. But nevertheless, I think he comes out of that crisis in the spring of 1961, determined to resist the kinds of advice that he was getting before the Bay of Pigs. Let's remember he was a skeptic on this thing before he approved it. He was not at all certain that this thing would succeed, and of course, it was a terrible failure. I think it confirmed for him uh, his sense, and it goes to your point about confidence, that he had the confidence uh, to uh, make up his own mind, that he would rely more on his civilian uh, aides. Uh, and uh, I think it's one reason why he acts as he does in the, in the, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I wouldn't want to over, overdraw this point. But I think one reason he is so insistent upon seeking a political solution, why he is so willing to uh, go his own way, be the only one in the room who, who preaches the need for a political solution, is because of his experience in the Bay, in the Bay of Pigs. It really uh, burned him in that, uh, in that regard. Um, we got a, a question here about um, teaching history from mm. Lauren Kroll and wonders what the uh, responsibilities of high school teachers are in this to complicate uh, narratives of the Cold War in the classrooms to, to school children. Uh, well, you know, it's a really good question, Lauren. Um, I'm working now, um, to, it's a roundabout answer to your question, I'm helping to create a case for high school teachers case teaching, which is very, uh, very popular at the, at the Harvard Business School across the river. And we do some case teaching at the Kennedy School as well. And I'm, I'm resorting to some of it in my own classes. But what we're trying to do in the case that I'm working on is we're looking at late 19th century US imperialism. And for high school students, making it, how should I put this, making it more, um, more accessible to them, uh, make them uh, debate in class the case, in this case, why is it that the United States pursued the policies that it did in the, in the, in the late 19th century, which, which led to the acquisition of, uh, of empire. Um, and it's early on, and so I'm not sure how that'll go, but I think part of the answer to your question, uh, and this is not just high school teachers. I think we should, any of us who are teachers should do this. Is we want, it seems to me, to make engaged, 
interested students um, really grapple with the issues. One of the things that I love to do is to suggest that it didn't have to be, that for the policymakers of the past, the future was a set of possibilities, that there is this contingent quality to, to at least much history, not all of it, um, you know, uh, it, this is especially the case, I think, when we're talking about issues of war and peace, when we're talking about great political developments. Um, uh, and so it's, it's maybe more conducive to that kind of teaching. But I think, I think students respond to this. And so it's, I, I think, a, it's a feature of my own teaching. Uh, and that's to undergraduates. I'm not taught at the high school level, but I don't think it's all that different. Uh, after all, these kids are themselves often just a year or two removed from high school. Uh, and, and when I look back on my own high school experience, those teachers I had, including in history or in social studies, who could do this, who could make me realize that this is absolutely fascinating and that various roads were open, um, that was just huge for me. So well, that's, uh, that's how I would approach it, at least. I've been alerted that Cindy Ewing has a question and she can actually hop on to the camera and audio here. So if you've been alerted that Cindy has a question, <laughs> Cindy needs to be able to ask a question. <laughs> Hi, Fred. <laughs> okay, I was hoping you might be able to give us a sneak peek into volume two of the Kennedy biography, if you would. Um, mm. Earlier in your talk, you mentioned that you were struck by how involved Kennedy often was. So it made me think about, can I think of a moment when Kennedy wasn't so involved? And, you know, it made me think of the moment of the green light. So cable 243, that's from August of 1963, yeah, right. Yeah. right before uh, Ziem's assassination, which effectively gives the green light yeah. for the president of South Vietnam to be assassinated. And of course, taking place just three weeks before Kennedy's own assassination, yeah. You know, Kennedy doesn't rescind the cable. They have this disastrous conversation about what to do, whether to keep it. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, how you're uh, planning on narrating yeah. that and how it fits well, into the wider work? Yeah, so uh, great question, of course. Um, and I'll just say sort of, I'll, I'll give you a broad take and then we'll get to the specifics of that case. But uh, volume two, um, you know, one of the things that I'm doing in volume one, and I'm certainly going to continue in volume two, is uh, to, in effect, tell two narratives. Uh, it's the story of Kennedy's life, which I think is one of the more one of the one of the one of the great American stories: tragedy, triumph, um, you know, health issues, all the rest of it, great wealth. Uh, so tell the story of, of of JFK, and then, of course, to be to be cut down at age forty six in Dallas. But also the second narrative, Cindy, is to tell the story of, of, of the United States in this period, 1917 to 1963. It begins in 1973, in 1917, as a kind of junior member of the Great Power Club. And by the end in 1963, it's the greatest military and economic power the world has ever seen. How does that happen? How do we get from that point? And he's born right after US entry into, uh, into World War I. How do we get from there to 63. And the conceit is, Cindy, that maybe we can understand both stories better by looking at the other. So obviously we need to contextualize Kennedy's life. That one is pretty easy. But maybe we can actually understand key developments in American history and to some extent international history through the lens of Kennedy. That's a, th a theme of, of, of volume one. And to get to your question will be a theme in, in I hope volume two. Civil rights, for example, very important part of volume two. The Cold War, the space race, the prospect of nuclear Armageddon, Vietnam, um, host of issues that I hope we can better understand through this biographical approach. Um, you know, this also goes to the last question about teaching. The tape that we have, Cindy, from the November 4th, 1963, in which Kennedy dictates into the machine um, 
for the purpose, I think, of his memoirs. Um, so he's just speaking straight into the machine. Many of you, you probably, Cindy, have used it, maybe, or at least heard it. But for those of you who haven't, your assignment tonight is to listen to this tape, which you can get. Uh, Miller Center and I think other places too will have it. But I mention it here because, of course, what he says in that tape, and this is two days after Ziem's assassination. It's all about how he responds to this assassination. And we know, listening to it, that it's two and a half weeks before his own assassination. But he says in that tape um, that the cable to which Cindy refers was badly drafted, should never have gone out. Uh, it was a mistake to send it out on a Saturday. Um, you know, it was not well crafted, which tells me that months later, he understands the importance of that cable, which basically, as Cindy says, gave the green light for this coup told the generals, the dissident generals in Saigon, yeah, you may proceed. You've got America's blessing. It still takes, you know, whatever it is, two, two months for it to actually then uh, gel. But nevertheless, that cable is really important. The fact that Kennedy spends, you know, part of this, this tape that I was talking about it is really interesting. The other thing worth saying here is I think he's, I think he's shocked by the death of Ziem and Ziem's brother, Nu, fellow Catholics. We could argue that it's naive of him to be shocked. Shouldn't he, be ex shouldn't he have expected that if you're going to approve a coup d'etat, these guys are probably going to get bumped off? You know, this is, this is not child's play we're talking about here. So Kennedy arguably should have understood that this would happen. Yeah, maybe. Um, he was kind of a realist on these things. And so, you know, but I, I detect in that tape and in some other evidence we have that he's actually genuinely pained and surprised by the fact that they met their deaths. And he understands, this is something I'm going to have to write about, that the U.S. commitment in South Vietnam has now been altered, probably deepened as a result of U.S. complicity in this thing. Uh, it's a really important uh, moment. But but if you guys haven't heard, it's November 4th, 1963. You can probably quite easily Google it and you can hear his his uh, musings about this. It, it is just an amazing uh, sequence of kind of contingent events there. Oh, yeah. And uh, the last question is going to go to Woody Kozad. We love Woody Kozad in our seminars here. He's asked a lot here, but just on this, he's asking about Lodge. He, he recommends mm. a coup. He's only been there for seven days after arriving. Is that right? Yeah, um, he, he wonders he, that's a bit hasty. Yeah, he's, he's an early, uh, he is an early, uh, uh, early arrival, if that's the word. He's, he's just uh, not too long gotten there before. And there's speculation. I want to look into this myself, Woody, yeah. about uh, conversations that JFK and Lodge may have had prior to his departure about what needs to happen in Saigon. I think the U.S. government has come to the realization secretly through the spring and summer that Ziem has to go, or if Ziem doesn't have to go, his brother, the increasingly influential Nu has to go, and his, and his wife, Madame Nu, uh, who is seen by the Americans as being uh, trouble, has to go. So in the joke of the day, no news is good news, is what Americans basically have decided. And I think that what I still need to determine is what, if anything, Lodge uh, what kind of instructions he arrives with in Saigon. There's no question that he is an early advocate of this. Others are opposed. In, interestingly enough, the vice president of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, basically says, Diem may not be great, but he's better than any alternative. This coup thing is a terrible idea. And that's something, by the way, as we think about Johnson later, this gets, this gets totally interesting. Johnson's um, frustration with the Kennedys and his belief that, you know, they never took him seriously and that Bobby in particular doesn't like him. Yes, but also this idea that Johnson feels very strongly that this was a terrible thing to have done. Uh, and of course, more than a few historians have, have, have agreed with them on this. So there is this split. And I think Kennedy's can, can, again, this tape that Kennedy, uh, this, this di dictated um, message Kennedy's on the 4th of November speaks to this division, but no question, 
lodge is 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 fascinating on all this okay fred well we're going to end it there but we're going to end it with this man um uh, we're going to end it with this because when you find that, when you find the secret lodge instructions or the instructions <laughs> to lodge, when you successfully um, placed JFK into into context, but then done the opposite, the inverse, which sounds really interesting, placing the rise of the United States in the context of the individual, when you've done that, well, you will have published volume two. This bloody pandemic will be um, over and we're gonna have you out here properly. <laughs> and so you can take these students to the pub and all those other questions that, that, that they asked and the things that you raised, we could talk o about over a beer. We gotta do that in person. Thank you so much um, for coming here. Before everyone signs off, um, I don't know if we can do the virtual clap thing for Fred, I don't think we can, but so clap in your room. <laughs> um, and please uh, join us on Friday at 3.30. 3.30, we're going to have a um, an international take on the 2020 U.S. election. So oh, we'll fantastic. see everyone then. And thank you very much, Fred. Fantastic Thanks, guys. Stuff. And Connor, Cindy, uh, Allison, and you, Jay. Um, really delighted. Uh, everybody take care. See ya.